And Madam Speaker, what we saw yesterday was a puffed up Chief Minister delivering a puffed up budget that condemns Territorians to record levels of debt, Sorry. rehashes announcements and claims credit for spending that has nothing to do with him or his government. Interstate tourists aren't coming to the Territory because of the Chief Minister. Gas developers, miners, solar, solar power developers aren't coming to the Territory because of the Chief Minister. Same. They are coming here in spite of the Chief Minister. They are coming here because the Northern Territory is rich in economic attributes that ought to be fostered and developed. They are coming here because the Northern Territory has a pivotal role to play in our nation's future. This is an extraordinarily deceitful budget that once again highlights the laziness of the Gunner government. The hard work Sorry. only begins for Labor when it comes time to spinning its shortcomings and its failings. Territorians know it is the Morrison McCormack coalition government that is driving economic growth in the Northern Territory, not the Treasurer or his Labor cronies on the benches opposite. The best news to come out of yesterday wasn't Michael Gunner's budget, Madam Speaker. It was the Commonwealth's announcement that insurance relief is on its way for thousands of Territorians living in cyclone zones. Of the many failures in the Chief Minister's budget, among the most glaring was this government's failure to deliver the platform Northern Territory businesses are crying out for, to create a climate, to grow the economy and create jobs. The member for Gwoja, Madam Speaker, said it best yesterday, heralding, this is a Labor budget. Well, it certainly is, because it fixates on spending money that we do not have and completely fails to deliver the incentives required to grow our own source revenue and be more sustainable going forward. Yesterday's budget, Madam Speaker, failed to deliver a plan. It's a budget that hits businesses and dives into the hip pockets of Territorians but offers nothing back for them in return. In the shadow of the Territory Economic Reconstruction Commission report, it is staggering that this budget offers barely a nod to the recommendations delivered by the expert panel charged by the government to revive our economy. The Northern Territory Chamber of Commerce laid out a pre-election budget blueprint for the government, top of the list being implementation of the Reconstruction Commission's recommendations to drive economic reform and reduce costs of government to business. Five months since that, government was, that report was released, there is still no visible roadmap for the implementation of these recommendations, other than three highly paid public servants with brand new job titles. It is also worth noting that John Langelant's recommendation in his budget repair review advising that government stimulus is not a sustainable substitute for private investment has also been arrogantly ignored. Private investment is the only way to grow our own source revenue. Private investment is the only way to dig us out of the $9.1 billion hole that has been dug by the hands of each and every one of the 14 members sitting opposite me a hole that my children and your children and Territorians' children are going to have to pay back someday. This budget contains nothing that will grow the private sector, grow the economy or create jobs. I think it's instructional to note how we got here, Madam Speaker. The extraordinary events of the COVID-19 pandemic over the last 15 months have been exceeded by the extraordinary budgetary events over the same period. On the 24th of March 2020, a supply bill was moved and passed on urgency, and at the same time changes were made to the Fiscal Integrity and Transparency Act. In one day, with no estimates process, no budget speech, no budget reply. The changes to the Fiscal Integrity and Transparency Act were to eliminate the pre-election fiscal outlook, which is normally an apolitical document prepared by Treasury to allow the people of the Northern Territory to be reassured and knowledgeable about the state of our finances prior to an election. What the government eventually offered instead was to prepare a COVID-19 financial report on the final day before the government went into caretaker mode so that the Chief Minister and then Treasurer could exercise political control over that document. This political sleight of hand occurred just weeks from an election and was entirely at odds with the Fiscal Integrity and Transparency Act provisions that exist. How did that report go, Madam Speaker? The Auditor General in her report, tabled on the 10th of December 2020, found that the Chief Minister's financial report was either unsourced or misleading 
and in particular around okay. two key areas, the impact of COVID-19 on the Territory and about the levels of our debt. Both issues were prime political and of, of prime political and financial relevance then and both important and ongoing to issues to today. I wonder, Madam Speaker, what the Auditor General will find about the Chief Minister's current political document. Prior to COVID in November 2019, 50% of businesses surveyed as part of Census Business Index considered the Territory economy to be in slowdown. The Chamber of Commerce shirt survey showed 85% of respondents rated the Gunner government as poor or extremely poor. We had been enduring the worst performing economy in the nation pre-COVID. Oh, how those opposite have short memories, Madam Speaker, or more likely would rather forget. Just last week, ComSec's State of the States report confirmed what businesses have been saying to us for years, that the Northern Territory is Australia's worst performing economy and has been for 10 consecutive quarters. For the 10th consecutive quarter, the Territory is once again ranked last on at least six of the eight key economic indicators. Compiled by independent economists, the report cements the fact that Labor has no short, medium or long-term economic plans to reverse the $9.1 billion net debt it has racked up over the last four and a half years it was in government. How can our economy ever rebound if we're ranked dead last in six of the eight key economic indicators. The report showed we lagged the rest of the nation in retail spending, the job market, construction work, population growth, housing finance and dwelling stock, all of which are important measures of a healthy and successful economy. Yesterday's NT News, Madam Speaker, showed on the front page that a major top-end shopping centre is now in receivership. What better example do you need of your failures? And yet, in response to what is absolutely a population growth crisis under your government, your government announces a flimsy five-year plan for land release as some sort of lure to grow our population. Your government has spent millions of dollars on purple rockets and branding about boundless possible, financial trinkets and offerings for people to come to the Territory, and it has all failed. Because what you opposite do not understand is that people will come to the Territory for a good job. They will stay for a great lifestyle, but you will not move to the Territory if the jobs are not there and you do not feel safe. And this government has absolutely failed to deliver the jobs and community safety that is absolutely required if we are ever going to have a strong economy. <laughs> we also can't talk seriously about growing our population without working hand in glove with the Commonwealth on migration and visa arrangements. That is why I have been in constant contact with my federal counterparts, championing changes to the designated area migration agreement and other reforms that will help support business who desperately need to meet staffing shortfalls. A glaring omission from yesterday's budget was the cost of crime to the economy and the budget's bottom line. There's the obvious outlays in policing and the resourcing required to maintain services in a large, sparse jurisdiction like the Territory. But there's the not-so-obvious cost that hits at the heart of our economy. The impact on tourism that a report like the Current Affair Exposé highlighted the government's abject failure to combat crime in Alice Springs and the profound impact that has had on tourism. You know something is going wrong when the tourism industry in Central Australia's biggest concern is not stealing the Marini Loop, which is so important, but is dealing with tackling crime in that community. There's the cost to business who have to deal with the impact of the break-ins, the stolen property, the vandalism and the impost it has on their insurance premium. Then there's the impact on the people, some of whom we have spoken to and have told us that the reason they're leaving the Territory is because crime is out of control. The Chief Minister's negligence and worse, his indifference was highlighted by the scant regard he paid to crime in his budget reply speech nothing yesterday. Four years. Nothing. <clears throat> We cannot have a strong economy if law and order is not under control. We cannot have a flourishing tourism sector if people are too scared to come to the Territory. We cannot have a strong business environment if businesses have to spend $5,000 on glass every single time they are broken into. And many businesses have been broken into multiple, multiple times. 
the cost to our bottom line, the cost to individuals, the cost to business, and the social and, eco and emotional costs weigh heavy on our future. And here we are today in the hands of a government without a plan. Yesterday's performance of using COVID as a budget shield was an outstanding joke, Chief Minister. Despite what you would like Territorians to believe, the economy was well and truly in crisis long before COVID hit. Long time ago. It's seriously concerning that the devastating economic shock resulting from a once-in-a-century pandemic has not been enough to force the government to change its approach to financial management. Instead of allowing the private sector to rebound and flourish as the economy re-emerges after COVID, it has wasted the precious opportunity to continue that positive momentum we saw during COVID when things just had to get done. We need more of that can-do attitude, not less. Instead of seizing on this flexible, agile and open-minded way of making decisions and working with the private sector, you have gone back to your bad old ways of throttling investment with mind-boggling arrays of red tape, blowing out approval times from everything to mining permits to liquor licences. And look no further than your protracted onshore gas moratorium <coughs> and Dan Murphy's, <coughs> excuse me, for examples of how it strangles business. All of it. It has dragged its feet on the onshore gas and manufacturing industry, and business has had to deal with regulatory goalposts being constantly shifted and expanded requirements. The Gunner government talks a lot of hot air about manufacturing and middle arm, but the Territory won't see movement in middle arm without cheap energy and access to water, topics that fell to their silent death yesterday. No talk of water security. No talk of the beta loop. You can't grow an economy without both. Approval times for mining exploration licence take 4.5 years in the Northern Territory Aye. compared to just eight months in Western Australia. Aye. Labor fundamentally failed to understand that throwing $45 million over five years does little to attract miners when at the same time your government is increasing mining tax, predicting declining royalties and overseeing a major drop in our Fraser Institute mining survey ranking since coming to government. Deeply concerning, Madam Speaker, is the government's abject failure to identify any savings in their bloated budget. In last year's budget, the Treasurer talked tough about uh, agency chief executives. They would be directly held directly responsible by the Chief Minister himself for blowing their budget. And yesterday he announced exactly the same thing, only this time he adopted our policy of sacking them for fiscal mismanagement. He was then at pains to justify why he won't act on unwanted departmental debt. Madam Speaker, the Chief Minister really is the boy who cried wolf. What makes his empty promises this year any different to his empty promises last year? In last year's budget, he claimed savings from a public service pay freeze that wasn't implemented. It was no surprise that he did it again this year, announcing savings from a public service pay freeze that still hasn't been implemented. Why? Because he knows he has to go head to head with his union mates and get through the EBA negotiations in August. And so any accounting for $400 million in budget savings is absolute fortune telling on the part of the Chief Minister. And for a man who professes to love the public service, he sure has thrown them under the bus quickly on this pay freeze, Madam Speaker. The question the Chief Minister refuses to answer is whether his budget contains any actual budget savings that have been implemented by his government. We certainly can't find any. Madam Speaker, the Chief Minister failed in his first financial set of financial statements. Despite this, he then proceeded to promote himself to Treasurer and went on to deliver another budget of the supplementary part of his first urgent budget in November six months ago. It was the worst set of numbers in the Territory's history, at least up until yesterday. Budget 2021-22 fails to outline a clear plan for budget repair, and its overall strategy can be summed up as hope for the best. It was lacklustre and dispassionate. I have said this before, and it is a point worth making again. The Territory's net debt has now eclipsed the entire appropriation for the upcoming financial year and is projected to further advance on that appalling mark over the forward estimates period. As we were informed yesterday, the Territory's net debt will be $9.1 billion by the end of June 22. By the end of 24-25, that number will balloon to over $11.4 billion. To put that number in perspective, 
For this, uh, our total budget appropriation for this year was just $6.97 billion. To put that number in further perspective, by 24-25, if the net debt was distributed to each territory, an adult child and newborn baby, <coughs> we would each individually be responsible for close to $50,000 worth of debt. We are paying $1.15 million per day in interest repayments alone. Madam Speaker, the deficit has also shattered any previous deficit ever recorded. This year alone, the Gunner government will spend $2.13 billion more than it brings in as revenue. That equates to $3.7 million per day that we are borrowing just to pay salary, salaries, provide services and keep the lights on. This is unsustainable. COVID and the need to provide stimulus has definitely played a part in this budget, but it is only part of that story. The Chief Minister would have you believe that COVID is responsible for our $9.16 billion debt, but it is not. In fact, the Chief Minister's own figures last year showed that COVID was responsible for $400 million in debt, a far cry from the wrecking ball that is the Gunner government. None of Labor's previous four budgets have set out a vision or a plan for the so economic and fiscal health of the Northern Territory. The early days of this government saw the shameless attempt to shift blame away from its own mismanagement to the Commonwealth. Then it started shifting blame to the CLP, even though Labor has been in power for 16 of the last 20 years and the CLP left Labor a $1.85 billion debt in 2016. Today we have a $9.1 billion debt. You tell me, Chief Minister, who is to blame? Who is to blame? In five long years, you haven't once set out a plan for the Territory. Your pathetic political posturing looked especially hollow last week as you trailed along behind Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, announcing hundreds of millions of dollars of spending in the Territory. And the only reason the Territory has any economic momentum at all is because of the Morrison-McCormack government. They are the only game in town. They bailed Territorians out with JobKeeper and JobSeeker. They promoted gaps while your government did its best to drive that sector away. They're pumping billions into its vision for defence. They backed our construction sector with Home Builder and now it's Insurance Safety Net. This is what is increasing economic activity and hope in the Territory, not you. No matter what the ultimate debt figure is, continuing to increase spending without growing the economy, increasing our population and increasing our own source revenue leaves the Territory in a perilous position. And sometimes, Madam Speaker, debt can be a nebulous topic, and when the numbers are so big, it's hard to see the literal impact. Territorians deserve to know how it is hamstringing the capacity of the government to respond to the needs of Territorians and threatens the ability of this government to deliver frontline services and infrastructure. Instead of investing in our schools and hospitals and roads, the Gunner government is borrowing $3.7 million every single day and paying $1.15 million every single day on interest repayments. That's money that doesn't go elsewhere. One example coming out of yesterday's budget is the fact that the government scrapped the build bonus grant for first home buyers, a fatality of its budget crisis. When the cupboard is bare, you have no money to spare, and the fact that this got the chop will have a massive flow-on effect. It hits aspirational territories looking to build their new home here. It hits the construction sector as well as a diverse range of businesses such as cabinet makers or air conditioning installers. The trickle, this is the trickle-down effect of Labor's debt. This is the reality that Territorians are being hit with under Labor. The consequences of Michael Garner and Labor's debt burden will burden the economy for at least a generation, almost certainly more. And make no mistake, Madam Speaker, this is the only generational change they are achieving. It will also mean the Territory will be more dependent than ever on the Commonwealth, especially in times of crisis. Yesterday's budget was a disappointing admission that you have no plan to grow our economy, no plan to manage our debt, no, ma no plan to tackle crime, no money, no capability and no vision for the future. And independent experts agree. <coughs> the last credit outlook from ratings agency Moody's showed the Gunner Labor government is completely reliant on the federal government to prop up the Territory's failing economy and has absolutely no hope for reigning in the debt. 
Moody specifically stated that Labor's budget measures, repair measures, will likely not be achieved. They even have no faith in you. Imagine how Territorians feel. As I mentioned earlier, Madam Speaker, the latest state of the state's report, again, Labor's the Northern Territory, the worst performing economy in the nation for the 10th quarter in a row. It is proof that you have obliterated our economy and the budget during your time in government. And the Chief Minister, for his part, attacked the report. He said it was deeply flawed and the Territorians should chuck it in the bin. Well, Chief Minister, the only thing that should be chucked in the bin is your hopeless government. It's another sign of your arrogance and desperate need to shut down dissenting voices. There has been a stark lack of urgency, Madam Speaker, and action from this government when it comes to addressing the issues that the Territorians are raising with us. Since the launch of the Territory, Territory Economic Reconstruction Commission report on the 1st of December, the government almost immediately began to backslide on those timeframes and commitments. And the Langelet report, well, that is buried so deep in dust it doesn't even rate a mention anymore by the Gunner government. First, we heard that Team Territory didn't meet for months, despite the fact that it was meant to be in charge of implementing the recommendations. Finally, we see the government's response to the Turk report. I have been going through the budget and the Turk report. And what really strikes me is the lack of connection and coordination between those two governments. But, Madam Speaker, I really don't know why I'm surprised. This government has never had a strategy, never delivered what it said it was going to do, and spends all its time spinning the wreck. We have no doubt that the Turf Report will very soon join Langeland, grey and dusty, on the Chief Minister's shelf. But, Madam Speaker, unlike Labor, the CLP is out there. We are entrenching ourselves in the community, listening to Territorians about what is important to them. We have our ear on the ground in every corner of this beautiful place we call our home. And while the Chief Minister runs off stage like a coward at his budget presentation, we are out there every single day listening to people on the ground about what is important to them. And one question we are always asked when we move around the Territory is, what would we do differently? And my team loves this question. What would the CLP do differently? It gives us an opportunity to tell people what we will do and what we won't do. We talk to people about how we'll grow the Territory, not hold it back with needless red tape and regulation. We tell Territorians how the Northern Territory has all of the ingredients to do something truly amazing. We have the sunshine, we have good soil, we have water, gas and minerals and rare earths, cattle and land. We have iconic attractions, culture and people with a fierce can-do attitude ready to take risks and give it a go. We just have the wrong people in the kitchen. The mob over there, Madam Speaker, is so insecure about their incompetence that they repeatedly claim that we would cut services. Nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. We wholeheartedly recognise that the only way to get the Territory out of your mess, to save jobs and continue to deliver services, is by unlocking opportunity and going for it. What we want to do is capitalise on the energy and innovation the Territories generated during COVID. We recognise the economy is fragile. We want to create opportunities by letting business come here and prosper, not hamstring business with Gunnar's government-style red tape. Our ironclad commitment to Territorians is to half approval timeframes across government. So whether you're a big mine or Mary and Breitling who wants to open a cafe, your business is welcome and will be facilitated in record time. We will legislate powers for the buy local advocate, giving that role some teeth and grit and reinstate the Local Benefit Advisory Panel to improve the amount of government business going to genuine local companies. We talk to people about our desire to create a territory coordinator with tangible legislative powers to facilitate and fast-track decision-making across government. From opposition, we introduced a bill to that effect. There are currently 12 private sector initiative projects on the major projects list. Seven of those are mines and one a petroleum project, the petrol gas project, that targets stranded gas reserves in the Timor Sea. Those projects alone will provide thousands of jobs and potentially grow the territory's economy by billions, including many millions of dollars in tax and royalty revenue. Turk and Langeland agree. The only people who don't agree is the Gunner government. Our territory coordinator bill 2020 put words into action and provided a legislative framework for the facilitation of major projects in the Territory. The Gunner government voted it down and replaced it with three new job titles for public servants. Madam Speaker, the need
storm is clear and overwhelming, and over the past four years, I am unaware of any new major projects that have been approved or delivered by this government. We look forward. We would look at the report commissioned by the federal government into water security and build the necessary infrastructure to ensure the people of the Northern Territory have safe, sustainable and reliable drinking water supply, and that we look to the future to ensure industry have the water they need to develop new agricultural and manufacturing opportunities in a sustainable way. There is no shortage of opportunities for economic growth in the Territory whether it is the exciting new opportunities in the agriculture industry, the immense gas reserves of the Beedaloo Basin, or the vast manufacturing and mineral prospects, we are the land of opportunity. However, slogans, catchphrases, and business as usual will not turn our $26 billion economy into a 40 or $50 million billion economy within the next 10 years. We, realize, we will not realise this opportunity with you at the helm. In addition, our needlessly complicated and antiquated tax regime is holding back our minds. That is why the CLP has a plan to introduce a revenue neutral ad valorem royalty system. We have heard nothing from the Gunner government on streamlining the resources sector to facilitate growth. It is not enough to say that the Territory should be the easiest place to invest. It has to be the easiest place to invest. In fact, the government has actually introduced legislation to be debated this sitting to try and shore up its own taxation regime against the burden of litigation as mining companies seek to clarify what the rules actually are and how the rules actually work. This legislation is a piece of duct tape trying to hold together their hopeless hybrid mining tax. Rather than trying to patch up their broken system, they should be following our lead and creating revenue neutral, simple, streamlined ad valorem tax system. Mining royalties make up almost 40% of the Territory's own source of revenue, by far the largest source. But that number is shrinking and your own budget predicts drops in mining revenue royalties. There is an enormous opportunity that rests here and you are wasting it. If we're going to fully exploit the opportunities that a post-COVID world presents, or even hope to pay down any debt, we need to act swiftly. The Territory is blessed with vast, mostly unexplored and underutilised resources. Harnessing these key resources will be key to our long-term growth, and mining is the single largest economic driver in the Territory. It is a $6 billion industry that could be a $10 billion industry or even more in just a few short years. But those 6,000 jobs hang in the balance, pending approvals, being dragged along by the Gunner Labor government. Right. Despite the moratorium that set the onshore gas industry back two to five years, we've finally seen some momentum in that sector, with the federal government spending $220 million in new investments committed Thanks to developing the Beedaloo the Strategic Basin Plan. $225 million on exploring the Futures Program and expanded road funding, with over $450 million already spent by operators on exploration activities. As an aside, one of the Federal Government's identified priorities of its Strategic Basin Plan is to reinvigorate the Memorandum of Understanding it signed with the NT Government in 2018. It's an absolute indictment on the Gunner government that an MOU signed a little over two years ago to moose mining investment has to be reinvigorated by its federal counterpart. But what have we seen from the Gunner government? A part of their conditions for approval, they mandated the Strategic Regional Environment and Baseline Assessment, or SHREBAS, as they've been come to know. Recently, it came to light that the government's tendered contractors to do these baseline assessments have had the work taken off them by the government, putting back the process by at least eight months. This is the Labor government doing what it does. Their own project coordinators cannot fulfil their own legislative requirements. The gun government. What we need now is for the gun, Gunner government to get in there and genuinely back the gas industry. We need to make compliance and approvals efficient and move through them as quickly as possible, whilst ensuring that environmental regulations are fully complied with. Make no mistake, the Commonwealth Government are the only ones investing in gas roads as well as $50 million to drill 10 new wells this year. And unlike the Gunner Labor Government, we won't ignore the regions or the bush, because we know it is in our regions and in the bush that we have the most potential. The importance of the Commonwealth is highlighted by its infrastructure spend. Incredibly, in an economy crying out for leadership and direction, the Treasurer has left the heavy lifting to Canberra. 
Budget 21-22 includes $1.619 billion in infrastructure spend, significantly down on the $1.75 billion promised in last year's budget. But this government is so incompetent, it failed to spend this so-called record infrastructure with a staggering $900 million not spent. Truly, a government that is all talk and no action. They have revoted $900 million unspent last year to this year. When you shouldn't spend money, you do. When you should spend money, you don't. That is the hallmark of a truly incompetent government. Shame on you. What confidence can Territorians have that any of the targets you announced yesterday will actually be achieved? If it wasn't so serious, Madam Speaker, it would be laughable. And while going over the budget on individual projects year after year, it has had substantial underspend in this space as projects drag due to poor planning. If we want to jumpstart our economy, have targeted infrastructure spend, then that is a good place to start. Infrastructure creates jobs and opens up opportunities for new and existing industries. But once again, it's the Commonwealth doing its part, investing more than $244 million in immediate works in the Territory, $120 million for the Carpentaria Highway upgrade, $46.6 million for the National Network Highway upgrades, and a much-needed $22.9 million for upgrades to the Stewart Highway at Koolalinga. This represents an estimated 1,050 direct and indirect jobs across the Territory, a significant job boost for a void left by a hopeless Gunner government. In addition to this, $472 million upgrading Larrakia Barracks from the construction of the new wharf and fuel farm to support Navy operations in Northern Australia. Separate to this, during his visit last week, the Prime Minister announced $747 million to upgrade defence installations across the Territory, including Bradshaw, as part of an $8 billion commitment to improve our military preparedness across the North. There is no doubt that the additional infrastructure spending uh, is key to any economic activity happening on the ground at the moment. But the Federal Government cannot fund projects if the Territory doesn't have them ready to go. And that is precisely why a CLP Government would invest in design work, do the proper planning. We need to have a drawer full of projects ready to go at a moment's notice. It is smart to plan ahead. But again, how do you plan ahead when you are stone cold broke? The CLP opposition will leverage our relationship with the Morrison McCormack coalition government and will fight hard for Territorians in Canberra, unlike the Gunner government. We won't just deliver lots of pace to the Prime Minister, Madam Speaker, the only thing he knows how to do. We will develop well-supported, well-thought-through, well-generating opportunities that the Federal Government can back. No plans, no ideas. Whilst there is an overspend on individual projects, the Gunner Government has an absolute history of overspending in all their budgets. And this means that the budget does not stimulate the economy as forecast and we get less projects for our money. <coughs> our closest example, of course, is the above ground underground car park, just next door to Parliament House. Before the 2020 election, the illustrious Minister for Infrastructure, Planning and Logistics confirmed the car park would cost $19.4 million. After the election, Madam Speaker, bang, tricked you. After the election, it cost $26.7 million. What is going on in that department? Garen Miller Boulevard was $14 million over budget. The demolition of the chair building next door blew its budget by an extra million dollars. And the Museum of Tears. Honestly, it's just unbelievable, unbelievable overspend. If it wasn't so laughable, serious, it would be laughable. And what about the playground that's now cost four million dollars, a whopping one point three million over budget? Let's not forget the four hundred and thirty-two thousand to move a bus stop from Cavanagh Street to Smith Street and then back again. Or my personal favourite, the two point seven million dollars on the ship CBD shade structure on Cavanagh Street that really doesn't offer shade. The member for Nelson keeps getting crosswork suntans uh, every time he walks under there, and you guys are still spending another eighty thousand dollars to get an interstate university to tell you whether it provides any shade. Well, newsflash, it doesn't. And so, Madam Speaker, what would the CLP do differently? We would plan properly, plan yeah. ahead, yeah. and yeah. stop the waste. Stop the waste. The waste. <clears throat> I spoke earlier, Madam Speaker, about the Auditor General finding the Chief Minister's COVID financial statement to be misleading. The Auditor General has also found the figures the government used to sell its projects are also, at best, rubbery. 
The right. Auditor General probed a list of 10 significant projects and found the number of jobs actually created was either a fraction of what was projected or couldn't be calculated due to inconsistent and inadequate performance management systems or found no evidence of the predicted job creation that could be delivered. Spin, spin, spin. Keep spinning those wheels. The report also found that despite claiming 575 jobs would be supported during the construction of the $25 million Alice Springs Hospital accommodation, it was estimated to directly employ 110 people. And okay. just 154 actual jobs were reported. The $38 million Gunpoint Road upgrade originally projected 177 jobs, yet only 133 actual jobs were reported. The $8.5 million Catherine Fire Rescue and Emergency Services Complex reported 130 actual I'm jobs, despite the projected support of 240 jobs by the government. I ask yes, people to keep in mind when the government's own Auditor General calls them out for not being factual about their jobs numbers, and we all know that the Deputy Chief Minister loves her little chant of jobs, 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 but it seems like the Auditor General is putting a hole through your garbage and is calling you out for what you are. She is calling you out for what you are. That is a hopeless, out of charge, out of step, incompetent government, and shame on you. No Madam Speaker, no any discussion about the budget and the economy must have a serious component about the crime crisis we're experiencing. Whether you're be, the people in Alice Springs have been desperately neglected by your Gunner government, whether you're in Wadi, Tennant Creek, Catherine, Darwin, Palmerston, or in any of our regions, Matarenko, we were there last week, Nolanboy, a few weeks before that. It is bitterly disappointing that crime was only mentioned once during your speech. How out of touch can you be? Combating the persistently high crime rates and antisocial behaviour in the Territory goes beyond the consideration of budget line items. It requires a political will to get something done, to meet this issue head on and acknowledge that crime won't go away by sitting on your hands, closing your eyes and running out of Alice Springs with your towel between your legs. Understandably, there is very little confidence in the community, in your government, to tackle this issue. The crime that is gripping the Territory and impacting every sector, every industry and every person. Police attrition is through the roof. An average of 10 officers a month, and we know that was a lot, lot more last month. The budgetary and economic impacts of crime should not be discounted and failing to address crime will worsen our economic and fiscal situation. We cannot have a strong economy without law and order under control. And again, it is the opposition who brought forward legislation to deal with this. And although your government refused to debate our bail bill last sittings, it is my hope that it will be debated this evening and that you will back the bill, that you will back the bill that is going to stop that revolving door of bail and target repeat offenders, to put victims, not offenders, first. All you've done is issue a press release in that space, talk a lot of hot air, and we can't wait to see the finer detail of your bill, which you haven't even given to us or the crossbench, for debate later this week. Shows how much confidence you have in your own reform. Absolutely zero. And we all know your team is deeply, deeply divided over this crime legislation, and who knows what washed up bill we're going to see tomorrow. The Chief Minister says the CLP government will make cuts. Well, that is nonsense. The only cuts the CLP government will make are to crime, and that is our ironclad guarantee, Madam Speaker. Ironclad guarantee that the only cuts the CLP will make are to crime, because we will always put victims, not offenders, first. If we cut crime, businesses will be able to flourish. The tourism industry will go forward. People in Alice Springs won't have to worry as much as they do. The economic benefits are so obvious. You just can't see it. You just can't see it. And what about health, Madam Speaker? Our efforts for our healthcare workers have been extraordinary over the last 15 months, and we you owe them our debt of gratitude. At every wow. turn, they have risen to the challenge and have kept COVID at bay with their health. It remains to be seen what long-term impact COVID will have on our health system and on our budget. And we certainly have been told uh, to live with it uh, for you know the foreseeable future. But what makes current reforms to health um, very concerning? I mean, we had a $580,000 report prepared by Ernst & Young, commissioned by the Department of Health, uh, which originally began as a COVID-19 response and review to recommendations. 
uh, somehow has morphed into an external, inter in extensive internal restructure, centralising power in Darwin, removing regional health services, and your legislation is ready to go on this effect. It, it, it makes no sense to take the power of health out of the regions. And apparently Territorians will never ever get to see this $580,000 report. It's uh, just buried away in the Gunner government's treasure trove of hidden secrets. And another, at least, Madam Speaker, we all know coming out of yesterday's budget, the reason why the Gunner government is putting the police commissioner in charge of international quarantine at the Howard Springs facility is because you're putting profits over people with a sweet deal for a $514 million check from the Commonwealth government. You have no idea. Madam Speaker, the Chief Minister's second budget as Treasurer builds on the disappointment and delay of the first four years of his government. It is a disappointment that will reverberate into the future and affect the productivity, fiscal and social health of the Territory for many, many years to come. The Gunner government needs to put its hollow words into action immediately on the economy, on debt, on crime, on population, on jobs. Instead, what we got yesterday and will continue to get going forward is the government's spin machine trying to polish a document that would desperately fall flat in all aspects, that relies on the Commonwealth's efforts to foster gas development and bolster defence. Madam Speaker, the Chief Minister's puffed up performance yesterday was typical of the Labor government he leads. There is zero substance, plenty of spin, and it's Territorians who pay the price. The CLP will continue to meet with Territorians no matter where they live and develop policies that reflect the reality on the ground, where Territorians are, in their communities. Our commitment to remain in touch with what really matters sets a stark difference between us. We are passionate, skin-in-the-game Territorians who have given our chance will make meaningful change in the lives of Territorians. Our only hope is that the Gunner government hasn't burned the place to the ground by then.